Hey everybody, it's Jason Plaha here, and it's time for the third and final part of the Q&A, so let's knock this out. Alright, first question. Hey Jason, when it comes to accessory compound movements to a periodization program, should you just do the normal three sets of 8 to 10, or would that negatively affect the adaptation to the rep range of the main movements uh, when you get to triples or singles? I know you spoke of pushing pr uh, progressions on accessories uh, that they are just there for added volume but should you change your rep ranges with them also thanks all right good question now this is where we get into the tricky nuances of accessory work and this is why people need to understand that accessory work is not always necessary and it's certainly not always necessary in all phases of your training um, yeah, you will absolutely interfere with your training frequency if you run a vastly different rep range on your accessories and your main movements on the same day. I don't care whether we're talking about block periodization or concurrent periodization. No, they don't need to be more than two or three reps apart. In other words, if you are doing triples, you're going to have to pick accessories that you can do fives with, right? Uh, that, in other words, that means your tricep extensions and stuff are probably going to start going out the door. Uh, you might be able to do them for a little while, but they're going to start interfering after a short period of time, after a few weeks. So yeah, you're going to have to pick this stuff wisely. If you're in a higher volume day, or higher rep day, you know, some 8 to 10 rep uh, accessory work is fine. Or, you know, your higher rep blocks in block periodization, yeah, that's fine. But when by the time you start getting down to threes, you're going to have to pick accessories you can do 5 reps with, which may not be tricep extensions and curls. Uh, when you If you get down to singles, you're going to have to pick accessories that you can do three sets of three with. So you're going to be limited to certain compound movements, but that's okay because here's the question I would ask. When you're going through your different phases of, say, block periodization, do you really need hypertrophy accessories all the way into the final blocks? Or do you just need them in the hypertrophy and volume phases? Uh, conversely, when you're doing concurrent training, uh, assuming you, you even have a, a relatively high rep day, well, isn't that where you would do any of this sort of stuff for extra volume anyways? And any accessories you do on your heavy days, you would pick accessories you can do heavy weight with. Uh, so again, a little bit of thought needs to be put into this. And people need to remember uh, that accessories aren't automatically a good thing and they're not automatically uh, necessary. Not everyone needs an accessory for every exercise or body part, okay? not always necessary and that's why you need to pick them appropriately and program them wisely this is why more advanced training requires people to have learned a lot on their journey all right next question i want to start doing gpp on off days i want to do farmers walks core work and light cardio do you think doing this two or three three times a week is good. I'm in the later stage of your novice program. I figured that way I could work my grip and core more and improve my conditioning too. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't think you should do extra core work on your off days. If you're going to do core work, you need to do it at the end of your workouts. All right, you don't need to do it on your off days because if, you, if your core uh, can recover from that then clearly there's something wrong with your training anyways but the thing is i think most people who are doing a lot of squatting and pulling and everything else if they do a little core work a very small amount of core work at the end of their actual training days that's probably about as strong as your core is going to get if anything doing a bunch of core work on your off days uh, is telling you that you probably need more total volume in your training or that you need more frequency in your training um, because if it's not interfering with your training the next day then you have a lot more recovery ability than you realize and as far as the gpp work goes yeah if you're in the later phases of it that's fine if you want to do some farmers walks um, and do some less cardio on your off days that's perfectly acceptable i just wouldn't do things like direct core work because you're coming in fatiguing and isolating a muscle that you're going to need the next day for training when you're on a very intense training program um, and i think you're going to find that if you do too much stuff on your off days you're absolutely going to stall on the program and you're very possibly going to regress particularly when you get further into it uh, so you just have to look at it from that perspective all right next question 
if I, as a beginner, decided to run some sort of linear block periodization, how much would I screw myself? I really like dislike most beginner programs and I feel like they're not as enjoyable for me as block periodization uh, with some periods of higher reps. How much are you screwing yourself? A lot. But here's the question. Do you care about progress? Like in other words, if you just want to do block periodization for the sake of doing block periodization and you don't care how much muscle you gain as a novice, um, then by all means do so. That's fine. Uh, as long as you understand that you will inherently gain less muscle and less strength doing so. That you're probably going to gain maybe half of what you could have gained on a, a straight linear progression. All right, and if you can accept the fact that you're going to do a year's worth of work for six months worth of gains, then go ahead. Perfectly fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that because it's your choice to do that. You, you're going to leave gains on the table. Um, as far as that goes, you like you enjoy doing higher rep work to each their own. I've met very, very few people who enjoy high rep work. Uh, volume training is something a lot of us do because we have to to get results. Believe me, I don't enjoy my high volume squatting days. I know that they're a necessity for me to put the kind of weight I want to put on the bar in the long term. They're a necessary evil, but they're not enjoyable. Rep work's not fun. It's not enjoyable for most people. Maybe there's exceptions. I don't know any athlete to enjoy it. Uh, but, you know, to each their own. Uh, but yeah, you're just you're going to make less progress on anything other than linear progression as a novice. Uh, and like I said, if you can accept that, then then that's okay. Do what you enjoy. At least you're in their training, and at least you're making progress. All right, next question. Hey man, a question about fiber supplements. Could adding a fiber supplement, a mix of soluble and insoluble, to my white rice help keep the insulin response down? And if so, is there much benefit to it? I know your stance on supplements, but for me, it's a, a cheap, easy way of getting more fiber. Cheers. Um, I don't think fiber supplements are beneficial. I've never seen any research at all showing that fiber supplements improve insulin sensitivity, uh, that they improve glucose disposal, anything else when compared to when they're mixed into a matrix of, of regular foods. Uh, furthermore, why do you care about the insulin response of white rice? And I do mean that. I'm not asking that from a bodybuilding perspective because they don't seem to know much about biology. I'm asking you, in what world do you live in to where this is a problem? Are you a type 2 diabetic or are you athletic? If you're an athletic person uh, who isn't obese in terms of body fat and you lift weights and do cardio, you're not going to get a massive insulin response from white rice. All right? Physically active, fit people do not get a large insulin response from white rice. Sedentary, obese people get a high insulin response from white rice. Um, this is the reason how many countries you see around the world where white rice is a staple do you see diabetes or obesity. You don't. You don't. It doesn't exist in those cultures and countries. Unless you take people from those countries and you throw them into America, then they develop those problems. So they don't have like a genetic protection against them. It's just that white rice isn't particularly a problem unless you're already sick. Uh, so you shouldn't be worried about this at all. In fact, the normal insulin response from high glycemic foods like that is extremely anabolic to your muscle tissue. Uh, it's, it's not something you should be worried about as something negative in any way. But if you wanted to add fiber to your white rice, Put some vegetables in it. S put some steamed vegetables in your white rice. Throw some frozen vegetables into your rice maker with your ri white rice. Problem solved. All right, next question and last question of the week. Hey, Jason. In a video you made yesterday, you were talking about how increasing volume can help push through plateaus, but you also uh, that ad added that increasing tension and reducing volume can also help. How would you decide which one to do when? Thanks. Um, that question is too complicated to answer. That's straightforward. I'll tell you right now, you know when you add volume? When you can't add weight to the bar with the same reps and sets anymore. Okay? In other words, if you're doing uh, so five by five, if you're doing five by five with 200 pounds and you can't seem to get to 202 and a half using micro plates and still get five by five, you're going to have to increase volume. You have to increase volume. Uh, when do you decrease volume to add weight again? 
when you can tell that you're getting close to your maximum recoverable volume. In other words, when you know that if adding any more volume is going to exceed what you can recover from in such a way that it will interfere with your next workout, then you need to reduce volume and increase intensity. And I guess those are the best guidelines to give. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.